Hello, everybody. This is Darren Redman, and I am speaking to Judge Mary Beth O'Connor again for the first time. Mary Beth has an incredible book that will be coming out on January 23rd. I believe I have the date right. This book, and, and I'm not overselling it when I say this, will be impactful. I think will change the way and the paradigm of people in recovery and what they think it needs to do. It will lift the shame that some people feel because I personally, unfortunately believe that shame kills many people. And uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, this is somebody whose book on uh, January 23rd called From Junkie to Judge, uh, a one woman's a, a triumph over trauma and addiction. And the reason I stumble on that, there's two things. One, I'm from Brooklyn. I stumble over all my words. Two, because it, really compels me to talk about, and we'll talk about it, I'm sure, the relationship, symbiotic relationship between addiction and trauma. And we need to get away from that paradigm that says, oh, there they are coming up with more excuses. No, it's called reality. It's called reality. It's like if you eat too much sugar, you may get diabetes. There's a, a reality to it. Um, Mary Beth, thank you for being my guest on Again for the First Time podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to talk with you and have an opportunity to share with your audience. I'm very excited to be here. There's, there's so much that I want to unpack. Um, I was doing some research about and getting ready for our uh, conversation today. And by the way, before I, I go any further, we are recording this a day before Thanksgiving. And so I want to thank you for that. And let's wish everybody a very happy and very safe Thanksgiving. And if you get an opportunity, people, take some time, go to a sober living, do some things, just care about some other people or give them a good prayer or a thought and just be a good person. And um, so Mary Beth, your book, the name is so compelling. Let's start there. And what made you write this book and we can unpack what it is and, and your history and everything else. Yes. <laughs> title I, I had the from junkie to judge from the beginning and there's a couple of reasons for that one is I feel like there's a hierarchy of substance use disorder in America that better to be addicted to alcohol than to meth it's better to pop pills than to shoot up and I was an IV meth addict I shot meth for many years and yet I became a judge and so I wanted it to really say that when you see those shows on television where they show people that are really uh, in bad shape because of their meth addiction don't write them off you know they are deserving of our help we have no idea who they could become if they're given the opportunity to go into recovery when they're ready for it so it's sort of to just say that that arc is a shorthand way of saying who we are in our addiction is really not that closely related to who we can be in our recovery um and then yeah the book i tried to i tried to do a couple things i wanted to show my childhood to really show what led me to start using drugs at 12 years old. I thought it was important to really um, make it clear that it wasn't out of the blue. It wasn't happenstance. It wasn't the wrong person offered me something. It was my childhood that made that look like a good idea. <laughs> right. No, I, I get it. And, and I believe you're from North Jersey, correct? Central Jersey, yes. Central Jersey. Okay. Okay, even, even better. I'm from uh, Brooklyn, so we're from a similar area. Let, let's talk a little bit about your upbringing, what you'd like to talk about. Uh, because a lot of people think meth, okay, hillbilly, okay, inner city, okay, a person that has no means and, and shame on them and a dredge on society. And uh, that is farther, farthest from the truth, isn't it? Meth, like all drugs, it's a wide range of people that use it, and it's a wide range of people that um, develop a meth use disorder. So you can't really put people in a box. I mean, there are certainly at different points in history, certain geographic areas that may be more impacted than others, but that's more happenstance as far as the uh, distribution chain goes or what, you know, Scott started there. So, um, so yeah, for me, it, it ended up being meth, but I do always like to emphasize I started with alcohol, you know, which right. is what most people in my time started with. You me know, too. I started drinking alcohol when I was 12 years old. It was Boone's Hill, Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill wine, which people my age, I think will recognize. It was a very sweet wine. That was my first uh, mood altering drug. 
So let's talk about that. Was it left out? Was it at, was it like, for example, with me, just to kind of prompt the conversation, mine was Schaefer and Rheingold beer that usually had cigarette butts in it when my parents or friends would have parties. The stuff that was left over, that's how I started. And they would get a kick out of it knowing there was a cigarette butt in there. And, and uh, you know, Jenny barred the door. So uh, how did yours start? It's, my girlfriend bought it over. She had stolen it from her sister. And I, I, I read in the book about how she put it in the basket to her banana seat bike, you know, and, and right. drove over to my house with this wine. And for me, when I, when I you drank it for the first time, it was really an emotional release. I mean, in my household, you know, there was... First of all, my mother wasn't really bonded to me. She just wasn't focused on me or connected to me. When I was born, I was actually wow. left in a convent for the first six months of my life. And wow. then later she left me for three years at my great grandmother's. And she was somewhat violent, but the violence really was much worse when she married my stepfather when I was nine. And he was verbally, emotionally, physically, and sexually violent to me. He was very violent with her. I'm sorry. So I was living in a household of walking on eggshells. You know, I was really tight, stressed. I never, it wasn't that things happen every day. It was that you really had no ability to predict when it would happen or what you might do that would set it off. There was no connection between my behavior and his reaction. You know, it, it, it took me a while to realize that, but that was the reality. And so when I had that Boone's Hill wine, I felt I felt loose. I felt giggly. You know, my girlfriend and I remember us just sitting on the floor laughing at silly things. And it was sort of like, oh my gosh, you know, is this what, you know, happiness feels like? Is this what it's like to be light and joyful? That was the reaction that I had. This was a positive experience. That first experience was positive and it made me want more of it. So now we're, we're, we're 12 years old. We're drinking some strawberry wine. Um, you have nice friends. You have a horrible thing going on at home. Um, walk me through what happens next. Well, I started pursuing alcohol pretty much right away. I would be thinking about you know, where where I could get it next. Whose you know family was going to be out for a, a party, and we could sneak beer or get whatever was loose in their house. I would even steal beers from my stepfather, which had some risk, but I did it. And also in New Jersey at the time, the drinking age was 18. And 18. so, all, 18. Yeah. so I mean, so younger kids, it wasn't hard to get alcohol. It was very easy to get access to. And I, and I was tall and I always looked a few years older and I always went out with older guys. And so I had pretty easy access, but I was always thinking about when can I get it next? In what circumstance, you know, how much can I drink? Sometimes I would drink at home before I went to the party so I could have a head start. I mean, this is like, 14 years old right, right yeah. um and then i moved on to pot which was you know prevalent at the time um i did a lot of pills but my sophomore year i did a lot of acid it was called window pain four-way lsd we did and then when i was 16 well, I'm, I gonna, found I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop you there if I, if I can sure because our stories with that is very similar up until the lsd part and i'll tell you why I don't know how old you are, I don't wanna know. I'm 57 and the reason I bring that up is there was that culture that said, this stuff will make you cuckoo and crazy and I, and I was scared straight for a while from that. You, there's a big jump in my opinion. When you go from the pot to maybe, okay, some of these pills and that's so good, to the acid, that's like a big jump. Nowadays it's not, but did you feel a little trepidation or were you like, Jenny barred the door, let's go? I mean, you know, the, the word around town as to the risk where I lived in, was that only people who were sort of weak minded would have a, a, a bad trip or end I've up. I've heard you that know, too. The, yeah, I've heard that too. Like, yeah, the hospital, right? That was, that was the way. <laughs> I was taught. The other reality was we had gotten a lot of misinformation about the about pot and, and other drugs from the adults. And so we didn't really trust them when they told us that there Makes was sense. a risk of the LSD. We didn't believe them because they had really lied to us before. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. People don't realize that. that, that when kid, Listen, kids' minds we know aren't formed until they're fully formed until they're in their mid-20s. Um, but 
when you lie to a kid, kids are smart, they're perceptive. Uh, you don't think they're smart? Try learning a language now, they, a second language now, compared to an eight-year-old who pick it up right away or stuff on the computer. Kids are smart. And when you lie to them for their own good, which is just nonsense, they, they don't trust anything that you do. You, they, they just don't. And I think you're right uh, about that. Um, that's a great point. I'm sorry, continue. But that's a great point. So I, it, the LSD didn't really worry me. Um, the math, that was really, I knew, a, a bigger step. Although I will say at the time, methamphetamine, it existed. But for me, this is the mid to late 70s. It hasn't really been mass distributed in the U.S. until that time. The, the biker clubs out in Western Pennsylvania were starting to mass produce it. And so mm -hmm. in at the time that I was coming up, suddenly the area was awash in meth and that was relatively new before it'd be sort of a rare thing or an occasional event not this constant supply of a lot of meth and so we didn't really we didn't think of it as highly addictive to us the problem drug was heroin don't do heroin that, that, yes. that'll get you right but we didn't think of meth in the same category although certainly now i would put it in a, you know the same category uh, but but at the, but on the other hand uh it was fairly early to see people would be up for a couple of days and they would be paranoid and they would be tweaking and they were losing a lot of weight. So the, the ramifications of using it were more obvious than any other drug I had done up until that time. Yeah. I mean, for me, the culture was you'd go to CBGB's, you go to some of these after, after, after uh, hours places, it was quaaludes and some of these things. It just, the meth didn't really hit where I was. Maybe that was a happy kind of thing. Um, I'll tell you, I, I had an incident where that frightened me, um, where um, I was in Phoenix and for spring break, and somebody offered me tie stick, and I didn't even know what that was, but oh. yeah, I smoked just so I thought, okay, it'd be like pot, whatever. And then we were in the desert, and I don't remember leaving the person we were listening to either Led Zeppelin or something stereotypical, Pink Floyd, something like that. And then we were in the desert. And I was like, how did we get here? And they said, you drove us here. Oh, that scared why? me. Yes. That, that scared me. And, and then, so that really, I had that frightening experience that, that I did not like that thought of losing control, you know? So, um, yeah. Did you ever have a situation like that where you just well, that you can talk about that you were just real lucky? You're like, wow. Let me say this: it, if I would have known that the meth was highly addictive at the time, I wouldn't have cared because what I was seeking was pain relief. What I was right. seeking was a way to manage my um, my stress, a way to manage my emotions, a way to feel better. And I all, I, I don't think I was capable of long-term thinking. I would have looked at it as a, you know, as a, um, as an important relief method now. And I wouldn't have thought beyond it. I mean, teenagers in general have trouble with long-term thinking, but I wouldn't have been able to care about that. I was so focused on trying to relieve my pain in the moment, that would have been as far as I thought. And so even when it became a problem, and, and I will say for me, meth became problematic very fast. And even other meth users would tell me, Mary Beth, you know, you, you, you need to go home and take a couple of days break because you're out of control. You know, um, I would lie sometimes to my drug dealer friends about, oh, oh, oh I, I took three days off. I'm feeling good because otherwise they would sometimes not want me, you know, to get more because they thought that I was harming myself. So they had my, my drug dealer friends were more concerned about my health and safety than I was at that time. And, which is an interesting paradigm for people that some of which will never understand that that's why you, you have to be very, in my opinion, you have to be very careful about who's a quote unquote good person, who's a, who's a bad person. The lines are blurred. I, yes. I can tell you as a bouncer in New York City for 13, 12 years, almost 13 years, that line is blurred. There's some bad people that people think were very good people and, and, and some people that are supposedly really good, really bad. You know, that, that's that's all I'll say. Um, the people around you, your mother, not so much your stepfather, who sounds like a complete horrible person. Um, did they know that you were going through this and what was their response or was ignorance bliss? They just didn't care. 
So I think that they probably knew we were doing that I was doing drugs. I don't I doubt they knew the severity of it, but I think it was more effort than they thought it was worth to try to do anything about it. My mother, one summer when I so I started shooting meth um at 17. I was a you know an IV meth user at 17 years old. And one summer I of course I had track marks all over my arm. Well in New Jersey in the summer it's hot and humid. I couldn't just wear like long sleeves. Somebody would notice that. But I had this bathrobe that was light material but three quarter length sleeves. That entire summer my mother never Never saw me except when I was wearing that bathrobe right. and she never noticed <laughs> now again we'll talk about fear and again the needle situation were you afraid with HIV and with AIDS which was so prevalent when I was young because I'm older when I was that was as big of a deterrent than anything else you just don't f with needles because you don't know where they've been or, or that kind of thing and um, but when you're involved in it, you don't think about that stuff much, do you? You're Superman and Superwoman. I will say I am a few years older than you. And so HIV wasn't really out in my area at the time that I initially started shooting meth. Um, we did know about things that uh, you could get hep C and other bloodborne diseases, sure. but we still shared needles sometimes. We So I avoided it when I could, right. but I would also share when th that was my only option. But so we, we knew, uh, we knew enough that it's better to have your own set, you know, your own uh, set don't share, but sometimes, you know, you're in a, addiction you do it anyway so but luckily i was lucky for hiv i will say that when i was shooting meth in uh, i moved to the bay area and went to berkeley and then when i picked up shooting meth again in san francisco by now hiv was present this is in the late 80s early 90s and they had a needle exchange because of hiv they they balanced out the um the risk the public health risk of hiv as compared to the um social uh, judgments that some people had about giving uh, people with a substance use disorder needles and they gave the needles away. They didn't, uh, it wasn't officially sanctioned. It's just that it was ignored. So there was a private uh, organization that would do a needle exchange. You would give them dirty needles and they would give you clean needles and the police would just drive by. And right. that was really an HIV prevention measure. And that's what, so that's what I did. I used the needle exchange when I was in the San Francisco area. And I, we'll talk about that, you know, a little bit later, because um, I'm one of these people that was born and raised in, in the boo, boo, boo kind of thing about needle exchange, who's now yay, 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 um, because you see, it just saves lives. Um, yes. And uh, it's palpable. And it's funny, we're talking about HIV and AIDS. I want to bring this up, up as a comparison to, to drugs. You have a lot of, quote unquote, well-meaning people who say they should know better or they, they, they know what's going on. And we have that situation now even with fentanyl. These kids, they're aware that fentanyl might be in the M30s, but they do it anyway. They're stupid. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. I went to clubs with some of you during the height of the AIDS epidemic. And I just use that term too, because it's a loose term to use. You were not using a condom for safe sex. You, you know, you were not. So, you know, we all take these risks because when we're, we're young, subconsciously, we think it's not going to happen to us. And it's only with maturity that we look back. That's why it's important for us to show some compassion and understanding because guilty is charged here, you know, during that time in the city as a bouncer. Let's just call it is. I am lucky. I am lucky. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Something is that the, the reality is that even though the overdose deaths are the highest they've ever been, it was over 100,000 for the first time in, in 2021, alcohol still kills more people every yes. year than mm -hmm. all the other drugs than, than that overdose list. Now, the overdose numbers are getting closer to the alcohol numbers, but alcohol is still the number one drug killer. And so I think sometimes people forget that it's very, alcohol is vicious on the body. I mean, the long-term impact of liver and other fit cancer risks are much higher, even with moderate use, but of course, also the accident risk and, and silly decisions or thoughtless decisions risks. And, um, but yeah, I don't get me wrong. There's a, you know, the, the, the overdose death rate is of great concern. We need to do everything we can to address it. But I do like to put it in the bigger picture context that alcohol is still our number one killer drug. And that status out there is irrefutable and people still ignore it. That's why I tell people, 
generally speaking, it's tougher to quit alcohol than almost anything else because when you step outside, there's a Budweiser advertisement or this kind of advertisement, and you're cool if you're doing a happy hour. And I'm not judging those people who do, but when you have to avoid that stuff, it's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah. It's interesting time though. So I agree. Alcohol has that extra layer of it's every it's on television, it's everywhere you go. But the good news is that for both alcohol and opiates, there is medication assisted treatment that has a a very, very high uh success rate, very strong data about the reduced risk of uh of, of relapse, about the uh reduction in the amount of use, about the reduced, uh, the, the ability to stay sober longer. Stimulants, they don't have yet have a drug for stimulants the same way that they do. The problem, though, is that in America, I think it's around 10% of the people that could benefit from those drugs, the, only 10% have access to them. And so it's still problematic getting people to have a drug that has such a high degree of success, or there is still a belief in some parts of the recovery movement and in the medical profession that giving someone say methadone or suboxone is replacing one drug for another when really it that's not how it operates in the real world they're not given a dose that's getting them high they're giving Correct. given a maintenance level dose and people function uh, if they aren't able to get abstinent on opiates people can function very well in life have jobs hold jobs be a good partner and, and parent on a maintenance level of some of these drugs and that is certainly much better than the alternative i so agree and and in fact i know some of some of the restrictions that people have for example with methadone that you need yes. to go right to the same place or this or that that in itself is not the problem with the drug helping the person live and survive and have kids and, and and raise a family and be with their significant other, whoever he or she is. The problem is that we need to open it up to make it easier for that person. And I feel that same way about Suboxone. Um, mm -hmm. I spoke to the late, uh, and he became a friend, uh, he was from our area, the late David Posis, who wrote a wonderful book called The Weight of Air, just won an award, about how he was on Suboxone for decades. and. It allowed him to thrive and live. And um, it's amazing, especially with kids, and I won't get down that road another time, another place. This whole, and, and you talked about this in another podcast, this whole abstinence or else, we need to get out of that because I'm sorry, that ain't working. It's 100 years, that ain't working. And, and when it becomes a moral issue, no. If we need something, I am on two blood pressure medicines. And I think for my age, I'm doing okay but I need those blood pressure medicines. How is this any different? I asked you, Judge, how is this any different? Harm reduction has a couple signs to it. One is we need to keep people alive long enough for them to get ready for recovery or be able to maintain a stable abstinence. And a lot of people do go through the harm reduction process and eventually get to the place of abstinence. It is not an uncommon pattern for people to do things like, uh, let's say they are using alcohol and, and cannabis and they think alcohol is the bigger problem. Well, maybe they'll give up alcohol first and keep using the cannabis cannabis. And right. then eventually later, they might give up the cannabis. In the old days, we would say, well, they're not abstinent, so they're failing. We need to say, no, they are succeeding. They have yep. they have stopped using their the drug that was the primary problem, and often they will later you know, address the other. But for some people, harm reduction is their long-term goal, or it's really the best they're able to do. So whatever box it's in, it's still, yep. um, it's up to each person to figure out where they are what's going to work for them, but it, and whether it'll be a process to abstinence or not. But regardless, even harm reduction means they're having a happier life. There's less yep. social cost because their people are using less. They're able, better able to be productive. They're creating less chaos in, in, around them. So there's just multiple benefits to it, including many people end up at abstinence at a later point. Well, absolutely. Now, uh, go back and again, I want to give away everything in the book, but Talk about how you made the decision or somebody made the decision for you or a combination of both. At the end of the day, it has to be you. We can't get people well. They need to get themselves well. I read how it's your book. Um, what was your turning point when you said, I need help? So um, 
I went to, so I, I was using, you know, shooting up in high school and in really full bore addiction when I graduated. I went to Berkeley for college and I did do better for three and a half years. I mostly used alcohol, sometimes pills or Coke or other things, mostly used on the weekends. But I had a really life-threatening multi-assailant rape in college. Then I moved in with an abusive boyfriend and I just couldn't hang on anymore. And I started using meth again in January of my senior year of college. I used for 10 more years. I did not go into rehab until I was 32 years old. And by that point, I had destroyed most of my life. I you know, I worked my way down the corporate ladder because I couldn't hold a job and I just couldn't get there because I was always using. I had lost many relationships. My body, I was starting to have physical health consequences. And I was just, you know, debilitated, hopeless. And my partner was ready to throw me out. So 32 is when I finally went into rehab, which was so 20, started using drugs at 12, shooting meth at 17, didn't go to rehab until I was 32 years old. You know, I, I, I'm te I tear up because I, I hear your story and, and um, it's like, you know, somebody who doesn't know you, doesn't know me, doesn't know anybody, and they just see a meth user, oh, that person's weak. Well, no, I'm a great victim. I get, I get abused. I get this and that. I'm the strongest person you'll ever meet. I'm the strongest person you But we love to judge. We look as a society, and um, I don't know why that is in the human condition, but it just is. So now you're in. Now I want to preface this. Did you see, ever see the movie Body Brokers by yeah. John Schwab and, and and Jeremy Rosen? It's a book on recovery. It's a it's, it's a movie about um, rehab centers and how some of them oh. are fine and some of them yes. are just for profit nonsense. How they they want you to be back, you know, to come back. What was your experience like? So um, for me, and this is 94, I actually have 28 years of continuous sobriety at this point. So I went into a well long-term uh, women's program. It was 90 day minimum commitment. And, Cause I do think 30 days, well, as, as broken down as I was, 30 days wasn't gonna do it. No. Um, and, and then I ended up staying five months, but I, in my mind, I was going in for medical treatment and I had to call around cause I didn't have medical insurance at the time. I had to, you know, call around to find a program that would take me. I was on a wait list for two and a half months. I had to wait and call every Monday because I didn't have enough money to do a, you know, fancy private place. Not that they're always better. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I go into rehab for medical treatment. And my first day there, they were doing a step study, which they would do every day. And 12 steps, of course, is Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, all of the anonymous is 12 right. steps. Um, and so my first day, they, they would read a step and then they would read the big book about the step or the Narcotics Anonymous text, and then they would have a discussion. And my first day, they were reading step three, which is made a decision to turn my will and my life. I think it's over to the higher power of my understanding or the God of my understanding. And um, so I, you know, being a good student, raised my hand. You know, what about me? Uh, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in the higher power. And it's God, but it must be a higher power. And I said, no, I don't, I don't believe in that. Um, I also, once I read the steps, I didn't like the powerless step. I wasn't really comfortable with the focus on defects, but they were adamant and vehement that there was only one way and that that was the 12 step way. And that was scary because I'm, um, I know it's not going to work and I'm paying these, I purported experts about, you know, for recovery, but also it's hard for me to trust my own judgment as to challenging them because I'm looking at 20 years of poor decision-making, you know, and right. making my life a mess. And so it was frightening to have to stand up right away and say, no, I, I know this won't work. I know it won't work, but they, they were insistent. There wasn't any other option. And so I really had to decide what to do. And what I decided was I was just going to leave my mind and my ear open and look for the parts that they were teaching me that I thought would be helpful to me and just ignore everything else. <laughs> and so that's how I started. That's how my recovery started. That's a, that's a wonderful way of looking at it. I, I've shared on this podcast before a personal story, a very good friend of mine, alcohol. Um, and um, we used to hang out at the bars all the time until about 5, 15 in the morning. You know what I mean? It's just, and we'd walk home. Um, but anyway, one time he needed help and he had the same problem because he, he just didn't believe in a, in, a, in a higher power. And um, 
this is after a vicious knife attack where he almost died. He was mugged because he was drunk in, you know, streets of Brooklyn, Flatbush area. And um, somebody said to him there, God stands for good order, for you, God stands for good orderly direction. And so in his mind, for him, again, like you made it work for you, all right, I'm going to put some sort of order together. So it, it came less about this and more of my control of my day. That's what That was his workaround, similar to you, you know, that kind of thing. Well, the, the, the problem for me, though, was the turn your will and your life over side of it, right? It's yes, not just right. that you have to believe in a higher power. It's that you have to turn mm -hmm. over your will in your life. And that wasn't a concept that I was comfortable with. And so, I mean, I did go through, I read all the big book and I read all of the NA text and, and classes. They taught some useful information, useful techniques. And I, I pulled out the ideas I thought would help. Right. Um, but when I got home from rehab, when I, I was in for five months, I thought, it, first of all, it seemed odd to me, really, no atheist in the history of the world ever got sober. I find that hard to believe, okay? Um, but <laughs> I emphasize it's 94. That a great, no that's a great way to look at it, by the way. That's a great way to look at it. To believe. Um, but there's no Google, right? So I get home and I thought, maybe are there other options? And I just went to the library and I did the research. And guess what? Lo and behold, there were actually secular options that they hadn't told me about. And so I found women for sobriety there. I found rational recovery there, which today mostly is smart. I found SOS, Secular Organization for Sobriety, which today basically is life ring secular recovery. I'm on their board. Uh, SOS exists, yes, but are. it's very small. And so I, 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 got, I did the same thing. I got all their books. I went to all their meetings. I read mm -hmm. and I pulled ideas from all of them. And I built what today we would call a hybrid or a patchwork plan. I built the plan that I thought was going to benefit me by pulling the ideas out from multiple places. And that's how, that's how I built my recovery. You know, I, I just find it interesting that, um, and let's start with the premise. Maybe it's not true, but we'll see that everybody is trying their best in terms to help people. But the thought that everything has to be this one template is just so ridiculous to me when any physician, any nurse practitioner will tell you anybody who's into the holistic approach will tell you that everybody's different there is right. there is components of it that is universal but everybody's different you know so especially when somebody's dealing with trauma and those kind of things and, and i tell people i want to talk about recovery in a second like people will sometimes say to me well they, they they spent all this money well if the addiction is still there, if those habits are still there, if the need is still there, they're not thinking about the money. And and I don't even want to get into why it costs so much. Well, that's, that's a, another thing for another time. But, um, you know, uh, let's get your recovery as long as you can get insurance. You know, I'm so happy you found a place that you were able to afford. Um, but people, I said to people, listen to me. Do you watch TV at night? Yeah. Do you ever sit in front of the television at 10 o'clock at night? You, you, you know, maybe you shouldn't be eating that cookie or ice cream, but you go get it anyway. Imagine if that was meth. And that seems to work for people. They just have that understanding that it's not easy. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about that person who, let's say, is in recovery for two years, three years, and they slip up. Do you say they go back to day zero? Do you even count days? What is your, what's your philosophy there? So I think, um, first of all, I do want to make clear, I have nothing against 12 steps when it's a good oh, fit for people. Yeah. It's for a lot of people, and that's great. I just want people to know there are options so they can find the right place for them and increase their chance of success. But things like tracking time, and another one that we might talk about is identifying yourself I Mary Beth when I'm an addict in a meeting, which is the 12 step way, which there's um, pros and cons. Um, but I view tracking time as a personal choice. For some yes. people, it's helpful. It's mm -hmm. a sign of success. It increases their confidence because you know they're seeing the number go up. You know, and I I I know my recovery date. I was brought up that way. You know, we, that you know your right. date. I know how much time I have. But for other people, especially if they're struggling in the beginning, they find it. Um, debilitating to, to keep seeing it's day one. First of all, it's never day one again, because you have always learned something in the first time around. You're not starting at zero, right? Absolutely. So the, so the, 
the zero is a little bit of a lie right in that sense of it. But for some people, they they feel, um, you know, they, they lose confidence because they're being told that they're back at zero, back at zero. So I view that, among many other things, as a personal decision. Is it helping you strength? Is it strengthening your recovery to track time? Or is it not? And the other thing is sometimes things that we do in the beginning of our recovery, later they're not as helpful. And it's okay to drop them. Just because you start with one technique doesn't mean you, you're committed to it for life. And so it's always good to keep your eye on, is this approach still helping me? Is it still benefiting me? And if not, do I want to make a new decision? I, th I think that's spot on. And, and so now... You go from somebody in recovery, how do you segue into becoming a judge? Walk me through that process. That is brilliant. And I think so motivating to so many people who don't know your story. Well, I emphasize the time frame, right? So when I had, uh, when I got home from rehab and remember I'd worked my way down that corporate ladder, I had a horrible, I had a really good degree and good grades, but a horrible resume. And so my first job when I got home was a part-time temporary low level admin job because that's all I was ready to handle. I mean, I would, I had never gotten up every day on time gone to work, stayed the whole, all the hours I was supposed to stay, not leave early because I was sick in the afternoon wow. and, um, and done a good job and done it the next day. And the next, I was 32 and had never done it. And so that first job allowed me to get in the habit of doing those positive things, right? The pattern so that it was natural. And then my second job was a permanent full-time mid-level admin job and then my third job was a supervisory job at a larger company and I got a promotion there and then when I had six and a half years sober I went to Berkeley Law School and so I do emphasize it's not that these things happen overnight right it's a positive progression what's the what's the right next step for me is all I, you can really focus on what's my right next job what do I need to do to get the skills to prepare me for the right next job. And then, okay, I got that job. Now what's my next step? And that's, you know, sort of how I moved forward. And so I got out of law school uh, in 2003 and I worked at a big law firm and then I did uh, class action work for the government. And then I was appointed a judge in 2014 when I had 20 years sober. I'm emphasizing these dates for right. a reason. 20 years sober, I was appointed a federal judge. And then I took early retirement from that job in 2020. That's awesome. That's awesome. Talk about that, what you can, how your experiences, and again, you got to follow the law, but probably gave you a unique perspective as to that person in front of you. Talk about that, if you can. Yes. So um, the talk about, I was an administrative law judge. And so the um, the kind of cases that I handled, the, the, the substance use disorder was a factor. There was specific law around it that I had to apply. Um, but certainly when I, and it wasn't just the substance use disorder that I saw. A lot of what I saw was the trauma uh, impact. I saw a lot. I had PTSD and severe anxiety from the trauma. And I didn't even realize it until like two years into my recovery. And my recovery process process on that took a lot, much, much longer than my substance use disorder recovery. And I still struggle with that a bit. So I saw the ramification from trauma, both in addiction, but also in mental health issues, people making, you know, poor decisions, feeling trapped, you know, all of those things. So for me, there was law that I had to apply in regard to those things. And so I would, you know, of course, get, gather the information, ask the questions that I needed, but I certainly wasn't making any judgment about who that person really was as an individual because of, of these of these uh, circumstances or these choices that they had made that were mostly harming themselves and not anyone else. Um, so I was aware of it. And I I just I we go in and get the information I need and move out. You know, I'm not going to beat them up about it or hammer over it. I just did what I had to do. And I applied the law that I had to apply. You know, it. You reminded me of something I've talked about before on, on my podcast, and that's my time as a college football coach. I remember one time in Brooklyn, I was like just trying to rah-rah the, the team. And I said to this one kid, I'll give you his first name. His name was Teddy. And Teddy was, if he was bigger, would have been a D1 athlete. 
Yo, Teddy, you come in from Manhattan. You live in Manhattan every day. You come here to Brooklyn every day. You must love football. Why are you here? And it shook me to the core when he looked me in the eyes and said, Coach, I just don't want to get shot again. Oh. Right? I just, you must have had those kind of moments as a judge where they just, and again, you can't apply it, but you just, that human condition, you know, is just, Everybody goes back to, you can't template everybody's recovery. Everybody has a unique story. Yeah, actually, a lot of what I saw, what I really wanted to do when, when say, the rules that I had to apply when they didn't qualify, what I really wanted to say was, well, you you qualify here, but next door is Susie who can help you. But unfortunately, the system is not set up that way. There's, there, It's a fractured, partial safety net at best. It's mm -hmm. not an integrated system. A lot of the people I felt with um, focused attention, someone mm -hmm. helping them giving them appropriate mental health treatment, appropriate housing or other resources. Two years later, they could be in a very different place than what they were. But unfortunately, I didn't have the ability to fix that for them. I could only, you know, apply the, the piece of it that fell within my jurisdiction. And that was the thing that really bothered me the most. I really wish there was a way for me to send them off to a different person or a different program that I, you know, that would be able to help them in a more integrated way. That was, that was the hard part. There's no doubt, in, again, opinion, Darren's opinion, that the system is fractured, that's a better word mm -hmm. than, than broken. Uh, but I also say this, a lot of people in the system really do care. People, there are a lot of people who care. Everybody thinks, okay, they're a bureaucrat, they're, they're autotronic. No, there's a lot of people who do care. And it's just, the luck of getting the right person or the right time or or not becoming disengaged with the system. I mean, there are times that I've had to walk away from things because I knew that my passion was becoming too bureaucratic and uh, I got to follow the laws. I don't get written up, but it'll be... so it, it's tough. I want to ask you with this with the fentanyl situation here in California, for example, there is a movement to not call it an accidental overdose, but to call it a poisoning. So right. there's harsher, there, there's harsher ramifications, which by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. But talk about that for you. What are your thoughts as, as a former judge? I think that criminalizing the personal use is the right way to go. I and mean, we've done that and it's always failed, right? We've had our right. war on drugs sure. for a very, very long time and it has not decrease drug use at all. So right. that is a failure. Um, I think we need to be careful on um, helping the individuals. I mean, look, don't get me wrong. Stop the drugs at the source to the best of our ability. Let's try to get them out of the system. But the, one of the problems with fentanyl is that people, well, first people didn't know it was in their drugs and right. people were dying that way. But now they actually, it's in almost everything, especially most of the opiates. But the problem is you don't know how much, you know, they don't know the dosage. The other uh, change in the overdoses of the past two years is that there is a much higher percentage of first-time or casual users who are dying. It yes. used to be that overdoses primarily were people who had substance use disorders, opiate use disorders, but or, or meth. I mean, there's a high uh, overdose rate with meth now, and there's fentanyl and some meth, but even separate than that, there are, right. a lot of people die from overdoses of stimulants. People don't always think about that. But the fentanyl has changed the game in, in a number of ways, one of which is that more casual users are dying. Yeah, and, and it's I've unfortunately spoken to mothers who've lost their children and fathers who've lost their children. And, and uh, here's the little bit of a difference that I've seen from my personal. Two years ago, at a local street fair, we tried to give away 300 boxes of naloxone, Narcan. Mm -hmm. For free. Yes. And I was out there alone. And I bring that up because people would come to me and they would say, What are you saying? My kid's an addict. My friends can't see my house. They're going to think that we're, we're full of drugs. Or I wouldn't want to help somebody with this stuff because I can get sued. And the, the culture is starting to change. Mm -hmm. I don't see that anymore. Now people understand that it's probably pretty smart, like having a, uh, you know, a fire uh, extinguisher in your house to have some right. locks on your head. Do you see that change? 
I, I mean, certainly the um, uh, Narcan is becoming much more available to sc more schools are supplying Narcan, more uh, community organizations are supplying Narcan because they're facing the reality that they're losing students and they're losing right. young people in particular. And yeah, so that's that's a positive that there's people are starting to face reality. And look, Narcan is a is a harm reduction. Yes. tool, right? I mean, right. they're trying to keep people alive. And of course, they do also pass it out to people who are opiate users, you know, in general, so they can save their friends, because we don't want, even if but, they but have- But that's harm family, reduction! Yes, let's save them. Yes. Let's save them as much as we can. So yeah, it's becoming- you know, it's, it's. I think part of it is that this time the demographics are are somewhat different, and so it's changed attitudes, right? I mean, it's that's why I talked about that hierarchy of drug use. Somehow, now that the opiate use disorder or the fentanyl deaths are getting young kids, middle class kids more. I mean, don't get me wrong, the the drug use among, uh, let's say, white middle class kids. Well, is no, I'll say white people, with blonde hair and blue eyes are now getting a dime. They, so now they, all of a sudden there's a problem. That's right. They, they've always used it at similar rates. They just don't get arrested at similar rates and that kind of thing. Yeah. But um, but now that that group is dying, it's sort of changing uh, the belief system a bit, which is positive. I mean, it's the only positive that is going to come out of this is that people are more sympathetic to um, the risk and the issue. And the truth is young people take risks that are, are natural. Well, many of their parents probably used a drug here or there when they were younger, but they didn't have it wasn't like threatening in the same way that it is today. And so there's a, a number of trails to that. But I'm glad to see America be more um, concerned about the impact and wanting to find a way to reduce the death rate. That's a positive. But on the other hand, we still don't have for the people who do have the opiate use disorder, we still have problems with lack of access to treatment yep. um, and all those other things that are still very problematic. Yeah, unfortunately, when people, especially our generation, the thought was, okay, I get my kid in by 10 o'clock at night or the street light comes on, and blah, blah. not anymore. Because now that kid is ordering his M30s filled with fentanyl, who knows how much, on, a, on, a, on an app, and you're paying for it with Venmo, and it's being delivered to the house. So the fact that they're even home doesn't mean that they're safe. We need to have a better understanding of this. And again, about the people, you want to stop, again, stop is a, such a pejoratory word, the homeless situation and the mental, there needs to be a holistic approach to all of this stuff because it all relates to each other. It all relates to each other. Uh, and um, the minute that we just try to segment and, and tear apart, you're not going to take care of it. You're just, you're just not. And uh, uh, these are human beings and we need to help them and uh, we need to show them um, grace and uh, not, not through reciprocity, but just through grace because they're a human being and we want them alive. And I'm sorry, but if the methadone or the, or the uh, Narcan gets them through and then tomorrow they can make a better decision, quote unquote, we won. So I wanna ask you this before we go, because this has been a, a really, informative and I could talk to you all day. Who did you write this book for? You know, I wrote it for a couple of reasons. One is that I felt that um, because I was a judge, although, you know, there's a certain there's a certain social resonance to that and that it might give me Jeez. the opportunity to talk about multiple paths to recovery, but also to get people to rethink their attitude towards drug users like intravenous meth users that I was. I want to stand up and say, that was me. You know, that is who I was for many years. Um, but I also felt that it was important to to show the arc of it. I really wanted, as I said, to show how I ended up using drugs. I think America doesn't fully appreciate the, the increased uh, rates of substance use disorder among people with trauma histories. It's four to six times at risk of developing a substance use disorder if you have a trauma history like I did. And that's that, to me, can help people understand what types of treatment are necessary, that it's not just to get the addiction under control, but usually there's other mental health and other ramifications from the trauma that need to be addressed if the person is going to get stabilized and really be able to recover. 
Um, but also to, that because I did my recovery the secular way, you know, a different mm -hmm. way, it gives me an opportunity to just make more people aware that there are multiple peer support options. There's an option that's going to be a good fit for everyone. Just do the research. Sometimes newbies say, how do I know, you know, which program's right for me? And I really think if you read up on, let's say, She Recovers and Life Ring and Women for Sobriety and Smart mm -hmm. and 12 Steps, one or two is going to sound like my people. People are there, you know, right, go your tribe. Sounds like your people are going to be, yes. and that's going to give you a good chance. Yeah. Well, you know, those who not, do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it, right? And you see some of what we were talking about in a condescending way about some of the myths that were and the lies that were given to us as kids. And you see some of that uh, just to tie in fentanyl to what I'm going to move on to. With fentanyl was, oh, if you even breathe it in the area, you're going to die. And that's just not true. And unfortunately, you do more damage by trying to way because they go, oh, that's not true. And then they're going to think that it's, it's everything is overblown and not true. No, it's very dangerous. But can we stop lying that you opened up a trunk and then just you were in the area and then you, you almost died? No, that's just not true. It's deadly enough. Let's just call it what it is. You know, well, there's no need to do that. So what do you say to a parent? And again, this is just opinion, folks, who says, uh, Judge Mary Beth, I found the needle in my daughter's bedroom when I was putting away her stuff. What suggestion would you give? You think, you know, it, certainly it can't be ignored. There's this, you know, if you've gotten to the point of, of the intravenous use, there's usually been a progression up until that point that somehow has been missed. Usually, I should say, usually there's been a progression. But um, if I were a parent and I realized that my child had a substance use disorder program, a problem, I would look at a couple of things. One is I would want to put them in a treatment facility that had specific expertise in treating children and teenagers. I would also want to make sure, do they have a mental health issue? Because often using drugs is a form of self-medication or for like for me also, where you're trying to um, handle emotions from some bad event that has happened. So make sure that if your child is that the child is evaluated to see if they also have a mental health issue that needs to be addressed at the same time. I would want to make sure that the staff, wherever I put them, as you say, not all facilities are good. You know, are there really psychiatrists on staff? What exactly is the program? Are they just going to meetings that teach about 12-step ideology or that are they getting counseling with, with skilled counselors, people who right. have, you know, master's degrees or extensive training in substance use disorder? Are they um, being given multiple peer support options? If, if they're in a facility that doesn't offer uh, at least educate them about the multiple peer support options, to me, you're not in an evidence-based program because the evidence shows that some people do better in other programs. Um, and I would, I would want to make sure that the program was long enough. I mean, part of it is how long are they inpatient if that's necessary? And not everybody has to go inpatient, but is there going to be um, support after they leave? What is the after, is there an aftercare program they can participate in, or is there something in the community? A lot of people, the 30 days, which is what many insurance companies pay for, um, that can be helpful and people can get sort of a break and get good information, but really it's the aftercare. It's the long-term systems that are in place when you go home that are going to be the key to success in the long run. Yeah. I wholeheartedly agree. And, and one other thing I'd say is you have every right. And again, that movie Body Brokers talks about this and ask questions, ask yes. questions. It's like, okay, here's what we do. We put them in detox 90 days, and then we move them to a sober, to a sober living facility. And no, no, stop. Who's in the sober living facility? Now, again, I know about HIPAA and all that other stuff, but who's running it? Is it 24 hours? Um, are the people, I don't need to know specifics, but are they in there for very specific things like my child is going through? You need to ask questions. Unfortunately, so many people know more about their car's warranty than where the kid is getting help. So another question I would ask is what happens if they if they um, use while they're in there? Are they thrown out? 
because right. you know that's the only disease where you get kicked out because you're you um you act the way your disease has you act right i mean mm -hmm. it's crazy that people get thrown out what will they do if your child has a relapse to me that is an important data point i want to know huge. how they would attack that huge there's there's nothing you, you should not be proud well we throw them out well no again each individual situation is each individual situation I had a friend of mine who had the cochlear implants on their ears. And it's very interesting. He said this wonderful thing that really I, I pondered. He said, being hard of hearing and deaf is the only situation of handy handicappedness, it was the word that he used, where you, people get angry at you. Because when you say, can you repeat that? Can you repeat that? They get angry. You, you, you know, and so when somebody relapses, quote unquote, and we don't know why and don't know how and, and we just throw them out. That is not that's not helpful. It, you just don't do that. When, when it's a medical situation, you just it's just you're not you, you, all you're doing is just moving on. So you're we talk about right? so your statistics look good. But that's not like so I think that's a great question, right? I, I, that's my that's one of my takeaways from our conversation today. When a person relapses or stumbles what's your protocol yes what's your protocol that's a great great thing so from junkie to judge tell us a little bit when it comes out and and give us the the, the two minute pitch before i let you go and again thank you so much for today Sure. So it's from Junkie to Judge, One Woman's Triumph Over Trauma and Addiction. And I do talk about both sides of that, the trauma and addiction side. Uh, it is currently available on Amazon and all the usual sites for pre-order. It will ship in January, but please do pre-order. It helps with my data points to get, <laughs> get the numbers up. Um, and it's and by the time this drops, it's going to be close to shipping anyway. So uh, it'll be very close time. But I do, as I said, I really, 30% of the book is recovery. So for the last third of the book, I go through what my process looked like, how I thought about it. And then at the end, I have guidelines and checklists for people to think through what their initial plan might be. And so it isn't just um, a lot of, you know, horror stories or funny stories about um, substance use disorder. It's actually trying to lay out a, a, a different way of thinking than some people might have done already about their substance use disorder or about taking a individualized personalized approach to their recovery. I thank you for your time. I believe that, um, and we're going to drop this episode right before the book re is released, um, but I'm going to let people know about it beforehand because this makes a wonderful holiday gift uh, for somebody. Uh, very, It's very personal, too. Uh, I think you are inspiring besides the fact that you will save lives. Uh, I think that um, you're in a unique place that you can speak from the level of a judge to somebody who's gone through it at all points in between. Um, I always ask kind of one fun question. I, I, if you don't mind, I need to ask you two. All right. One, pizza in New Jersey and New York to me is just so great. Um, what do you say is the difference? If you, if, you, if you do still eat that between New York, New Jersey, East Coast pizza and everything else? Well, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is, you know, people see California, but California is a big state. There's a lot of yep. different sizes. And I, I like New Jersey, but what I really didn't like was the cold. <laughs> no, me too. Me too. And by the way, San Francisco, I'm going to plug um, Escape from New York Pizza is dynamite. And if you ever go to Tenderloin <laughs> District, which I do a lot, there's some great pizza up there too. But here's my last question. It's 1.30 in the morning. You're tired. You're going to bed and you notice something's on television, what, whether it's a television show or a movie, would keep you up, regardless of the fact that you've seen it 9,000 times? I mean, I don't tend to stay up that late. I'm an early bird. So um, I will say that I, uh, you know, I'm a movie person. And so it would, it would, it would be a movie. It would almost certainly be a movie that I didn't want to pause, that I felt like I was going to lose the momentum of the movie, that I was going to lose that immersive experience if I took the break. So that would do it more than a TV show. Yeah, definitely a movie. I, I mean, it could be any number of them. I've seen a lot of good movies that I like, but, um, but it would be a, wanting to ride the story through to the end, you know, not wanting to mm -hmm. disrupt the emotional journey. Well, I'm, I'm a big movie person myself, and uh, I would tell you this, two best movies I've seen this year, for me, 
was Where the Crow Dead Sing and the movie Till. If you get a chance, see them both. They're outstanding. And right, Mary Beth O'Connor, thank you so much for being my guest today. I hope you enjoyed the time. I enjoyed talking to Mary Beth O'Connor again for the first time. Thank you. Thank you.